So our focus for Resolute is Solomon today, coming out of the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon appears to be resolute to find purpose or meaning in life. And that's a big thing. This, the concept of finding purpose or meaning in life is a big thing. It seems as though humanity in general, at some point in time, asks themselves, like, why am I here? What's the meaning or purpose of life? What's the meaning or purpose of my life? And at some point in his life, Solomon pondered this a lot. And he spoke about it a lot. And in a nutshell, the book of Ecclesiastes sums up his thoughts this way. When you realize life has no meaning. (laughs) But it does, so hold on, hang in there, because it does. It seems as though life is meaningless under the sun, according to Solomon. There are actually 12 chapters in the book of Ecclesiastes, and several of them also address this concept. There's no way I was born to just pay bills and die. This is kind of Solomon's mindset. If you've read the book before or you read it over the last couple days, this is kind of, is this all we do? Work and then die? There's got to be more to it. But I have decided, I found this little cartoon, Solomon can be thankful. We all can be thankful that we are not toilet paper. The little (laughs) baby toilet paper says, Dad, what's the purpose of life? And the mother, toilet paper, comes in and says, what did you tell him? He says, he asked. <clears throat> Be glad you don't have the purpose of toilet paper in your life. But aside from the purpose of toilet paper, we all were created with a purpose and for a purpose. We are not here by accident. We aren't random acts or masses of matter that just inexplicably formed with no meaning or purpose other than to just exist and then die. Why? Because God has purpose. God has intent. God has a plan. And God has meaning. And we are made in the image of God. That means then we have purpose and we have intent and we have meaning and there is also a plan for our life. Most people get stuck with, well, what is it? What is that meaning? What is that purpose? What is that plan? And I'm hoping today that we're gonna take the pressure off of this to re- and reveal to you really actually how simplistic the meaning and the purpose of our life is. So open your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. It's gonna be somewhat central, Psalms, Proverbs, and then Ecclesiastes. So if you kind of start in the center of your Bible, it's gonna be there. And I would like to read from you from the... The version of the Message Bible has an introduction to all of the books of the Bible. And I wanted to read to you part of this introduction. It says this about the book of Ecclesiastes. Unlike the animals who seem quite content to simply be themselves, we humans are always looking for ways to be more than other than that what we find ourselves to be. We explore the countryside for excitement, search our souls for meaning, shop the world for pleasure. We try this and then we try that. The usual fields of endeavor are money, sex, power, adventure, and knowledge. Everything we try is so promising at first, but nothing ever really seems to amount to much. We intensify our efforts, but the harder we work at it, the less we get out of it. Some people give up early and settle for a humdrum life. Others never seem to learn, so they flail away through a lifetime, becoming less and less human by the year until by the time they die, there is hardly enough humanity left to compose a corpse." It is our propensity to go off on our own, trying to be human by our own devices and desires. That makes Ecclesiastes necessary reading. Ecclesiastes sweeps our souls clean of all 
quote, lifestyle spiritualities so that we can be ready for God's visitation revealed in Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes is a John the Baptist kind of book. It functions not as a meal, but as a bath. It is not nourishment, it is cleansing, it is repentance, it is purging. We read Ecclesiastes to get scrubbed clean from illusion and sentiment, from ideas that are idolatrous and feelings that cloy. It is an expose and rejection of every arrogant and ignorant expectation that we can live our lives by ourselves and on our own terms. Ecclesiastes challenges the naive optimism that sets a goal that appeals to us and then goes after it with gusto, expecting the result to be a good life. The author's cool skepticism, a refresh, refreshing negation to the lush and seductive suggestions swirling around us, promising everything but delivering nothing, clears the air. And once the air is cleared, we are ready for reality, for God. Isn't that a great introduction that gives you a little peek about the necessity of the book of Ecclesiastes, in a sense saying that if we are searching for meaning and purpose in this world through our own heart's desires and what we think is meaningful and purposeful, it's really going to amount to nothing, just as the author of Ecclesiastes talks about. And so we're gonna be digging deep into that today. It's believed that the author of Ecclesiastes is Solomon, even though it doesn't say his name. Uh, some doubt that and say it's another person who wrote in Solomon's name. But based on several passages and scriptures in the book, I tend to lean towards Solomon actually being the author, author so I'll be referring to him today. The word Ecclesiastes means the preacher or the speaker of an assembly or the purpose uh, and the purpose of the book. You, somebody who's preaching or speaking towards an assembly, that is actually what Ecclesiastes means. And the purpose of the book is to teach and remind us that life outside of God is actually meaningless. Now, if you've read it, you might have felt a bit depressed. <laughs> like, how many more chapters do I have to read the word meaningless, meaningless? It's all meaningless. But here's the thing. I hope to share with you today why and how that actually makes sense. Okay? But it does read a little depressing. In fact, this is how it opens. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless said the teacher, not just meaningless, utterly meaningless, and how much of it? Everything is meaningless. I don't think Solomon made, would have made the cheer squad of any team. <laughs> he would have been asked to leave. I'd like to tell you that the book kind of picks up and cheers up, but it really doesn't. It speaks to the reality of a very self-absorbed, self-focused, selfish life. And ultimately, that has no meaning or purpose for all of us. Let me give you just an overview, a quick overview of the book. In chapter one, this continues on and speaks of the monotony of life. In chapter two, the author searches for happiness and purpose under the sun and really concludes with all of that is meaningless. We're gonna spend time there today. Chapter three, you might be familiar with chapter three. There's a season for everything. Do you remember what comes before it? Turn, turn, turn. Why are those words important? Because later it says God is eternal. Nothing adds to him, nothing changes or takes takes away from him or it, and he's eternal. So in a sense, chapter three is like, life is just this constant turning. Things come and things go. We do this, we do that. And it's sort of like this hamster wheel idea, but God is eternal. He's the same, he's consistent. He actually doesn't turn, he doesn't change. He is the one that we can count on. 
so we see a glimpse of kind of hope in God, a glimpse of Solomon, a glimpse of the author, shifting his focus a little bit in the eternal in chapter three. But chapter four, it goes on to speak of the social evils apart from the faith. All of that too is meaningless. Chapter five is the meaninglessness of riches. So just use them, spend your money, eat, drink, and be merry and enjoy life. Chapter six, the meaninglessness of a long life. Why be here? It's so toilsome, it's so hard. What's the purpose of a long life? Chapter seven is a series of wise sayings, very much like Proverbs. Chapter eight, the uncertainty of life and truth. Really, in chapter eight, you have no control over the day you're gonna die. What's the point? (laughs) Chapter nine, he speaks of the indiscriminatory nature of the righteous and the wicked. I don't care how good you are, I don't care how awful you are, we're all going to the grave. Chapter 10, more wise sayings in the contrast between wisdom and folly. Chapter 11, he offers advice on generosity and to the young. And chapter 12, he describes old age and then in his final words and his conclusion, he stops thinking about the concept of under the sun and he encourages us to look to the eternal and he closes a statement with what I would consider the purpose of life. And so we will get there. Okay, hang on, we will get there. Now that's just an overview. If you didn't get a chance to read it, I encourage you to read that this week. We're gonna sit and focus our time today where Solomon searched for purpose and what did he find? The last six verses of chapter one, this is what we read. As Solomon searched for purpose in wisdom. He's looking for it in wisdom. Ecclesiastes 1, chapter 12. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I have seen all these things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I thought to myself, look, I've grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. And then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom wisdom, and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Anybody else want to curl up and go back to bed? So let's understand this a little bit more. This term under the sun or under heaven is used several times throughout this whole book. And it's really a way of looking at the world with no eternal perspective. Wisdom here is wisdom of the world. In a sense, what does the world say is wise? What is culture telling us is smart? What are all the secular self-help books telling us we should or shouldn't do? This is the wisdom that we're speaking of. What is the current culture promoting for you in order for you to live a meaningful and purposeful life? And this wisdom that the teacher is speaking of, he's likely been well-read of it or well-versed in it. He likely keeps up with cultural affairs and even suggestions. He speaks to the intellect and the learned, the philosophers, the educators of his time. He knows things. He says, like, I, I developed my life to the study and understanding of all of these things. All of these things under the sun. All of these things that are earthly related. All of these things that the world considers wisdom, I've read and learned all about them. And what does he conclude? Really, it doesn't matter how much you know, how much you've read, how many conferences you've attended or gone to, how wide your circle is of knowledge of people. There is no way, he says, there's no way to straighten what is twisted and count what is lacking. Meaning, there's no way for us under the sun in our own wisdom, in our own knowledge, in cultural way of speaking to figure out all of life's unanswered questions. Life is twisty. 
It doesn't make sense. It's not always fair. And he, in all the things that he's read and all the things that he's checked out, he's like, I still can't make sense of all of this. And he says, and I can't count for things that aren't there either. I can't straighten what's twisted and I can't count what is lacking, what doesn't make sense. That means for all of you who might be a type A logical thinker who loves Excel spreadsheets and PowerPoint presentations, sorry. And if you were here last week, that makes you a beaver, okay? If you were here for Dr. Greg Tonkinson's lesson, that would make you a beaver. In fact, the more knowledge and wisdom that we try and fit all of life into a perfect little system and organize it into an Excel sheet or create a PowerPoint on it, the more we try and do that, the more we know, the more we understand, the more we learn, in a sense it's saying, this leads to actually more sorrow and more grief. Knowledge is power without question. There's nothing wrong with getting educated. But sometimes ignorance is bliss. I find it fascinating that in a world where there are hundreds and thousands of books and articles on self-help, that the anxiety, the depression, and the suicide rates continue to rise. Doesn't that put a question mark in your mind as well? If this is the answer, if learning all about the world has to say about wisdom of what's under the sun is actually the answer to find meaning and purpose in your life, why do we have more depression, more anxiety, and more suicide? Perhaps, maybe perhaps, this horizontal, and I don't even know if it's horizontal anymore. I think it's just one cent. We're turning our cameras this way. And we're pointing it all on self. And perhaps that view of the meaning and purpose of life is actually indeed a chasing after the wind. The second thing Solomon searches for is pleasure. He says in Ecclesiastes 2, chapter, or verse 1 through 3, I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish, and what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, and my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Let me summarize this for you in today's modern day language. He partied a lot and got drunk and did stupid things. <laughs> this word laughter is actually not funny, ha ha, the way we think of laughter. It actually speaks of partying. So for Solomon, it was always five o'clock somewhere. It was New Year's Eve, it was Cinco de Mayo, it was his birthday. It was any reason any of us have a reason to fulfill the pleasures or the desires of the heart, to test and see, is this good? Is this actually fun? Does this bring me fulfillment? Do I like better? Is my life more meaningful when I engage in all the pleasures of the world like this? Do you notice the words highlighted here, heart, myself, and mind? These are all the same word in the Hebrew language, lib, meaning the inner self, the soul, or the heart. You know what it literally said when I looked up this word? Where resolution resides. Determination, the will. When we're resolute towards something, that's where in our inner being. And he was like, I thought in where I'm resolute, come now, I'm going to test with pleasure. I was trying to cheer my inner self, my inner resolution with wine and drunkenness and folly and partying. We'll find out the result of that in just a minute. The text goes on to say he searched for purpose in accomplishments. Verses four through six, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruits and trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. What a man! <clears throat> 
Building things, making things, planting things. Pretty impressive. I kind of thought to myself, no wonder he had a thousand wives or more. They probably wondered. Hopefully, he cleaned up after himself, right, ladies? <laughs> he did some incredible things. He, that could have even been considered important and meaningful. In a sense, he searched for meaning and purpose in his work, in his successes, in his accomplishments. And how easy can it be for any or all of us to do that? Or maybe, just maybe the enemy can play the game the other way and lie to us, telling us that if we don't have certain accomplishments, or we don't have certain successes, or we don't have a certain job, that we are without purpose. Because there's so much emphasis on purpose placed in accomplishments and placed in successes and placed in careers or jobs. The enemy takes that and he finds a crack in anyone's armor and he wiggles his way through it and says, because you don't have these things, therefore you have no meaning and you have no purpose. And if we fall for that lie, because that is not just a meaningless statement, that is absolute, a flat out lie from the devil himself. Because God says otherwise, as we will see. None of our purpose or meaning in life can be found in accomplishments. The fourth thing Solomon says that we read is that he searched for purpose in possessions. Continuing on in chapter two, verse seven, I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of a man. He was a wealthy man. A first class flight to Egypt would have been chump change for Solomon. He had investments, he had money, he had collateral, he had valuables, he had servants, and what seems to be like a private brothel maybe? This word harem is a little questionable. It's the Hebrew word sada, which is concubine wife or harem. And if you look it up, it literally says meaning unknown for this context. It's actually only used one time. This word harem here and the, the Hebrew word for it is only used one time in the Bible right here. That's it. And we don't 100% know its context. But at any rate, what we do know is that Solomon had a lot of women available to him, as the Bible says, to delight the heart of man. <laughs> now, what did he conclude after all of this? Possessions, accomplishments, pleasure, and wisdom. Everything is meaningless. And here are the key words, under the sun. Verse 11, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. This is so opposite, you guys, of today's message to you and I. You know what today's message is? All of these things give you meaning and give you purpose. You just need to find more of yourself. You need to just find the right job. You just need to have a little more money. You just need a little work a little bit harder. You just need to do a little more volunteer work. You just need to have a little more wisdom. Get another degree. Get another whatever. Then you'll have meaning and then you'll have purpose. And what the teacher, the author of Ecclesiastes Solomon says was, I did all that and guess what the conclusion was? Things with an earthly perspective under the sun is a chasing after the wind and meaningless. Now, I want to clarify something. You can feel as though you don't have meaning and purpose in your life and actually still somewhat enjoy your life. 
There are plenty of people who go around enjoying their lives. They travel, they see things of the world, they have experiences. And yet somewhere in them, they're still like, I just don't know why I'm here. But they're still eating, drinking, being merry, and enjoying the people around them. So purpose and meaning doesn't always connect with what we see on the outside of someone's experiences or happiness or the way they're living their life. And we're talking today specifically about the meaning and the purpose of life. What he's saying is we cannot find meaning and purpose with this earthly perspective. So I appreciate Ecclesiastes being depressive. Praise God that it's depressive that we don't find our meaning and our purpose in ourselves and our money and our possessions and in our accomplishments. Thank God for that. Because Jesus Christ is bigger than all of that. Now, we may still have troubles, of course. Once you find your purpose and meaning in life doesn't mean you're not going to have any troubles in life. But praise God, Jesus says, you'll have troubles in this life, but overcome, but take heart what I have overcome the world. We have that. When we are only looking through this earthly lens, through a worldly lens, then everything we have and everything we do when it relates to meaning and purpose is just a chasing after the wind. Yep, we can eat, drink, and be merry in our life and in our existence. But if we want true meaning and purpose, it won't fulfill. It won't fulfill that. Really what it's saying is in your meaningless existence, you might just have a little bit better of a time. But you're not going to find purpose and meaning. If life has no meaning and purpose, the attitude here is might as well just live it and enjoy it. But here's the thing. Life does have meaning and it does have purpose. Remember, you're created with and for a purpose. Why? We actually have this desire in our heart that needs to be filled with something that validates why we are here and why we exist. You can go around as happy, eat, drink, and be merry as you want, but if you don't know why you're here and why your life has meaning, it will constantly haunt you. You will be thinking about it all the time. There's kind of this desire what some would call a hole filled in our heart that needs to validate why we exist. When Adam and Eve were created, they naturally lived out their purpose fully in walking with God and worshiping God and being in relationship with God. They didn't ask after they were created, what's my purpose? Why are we here, Eve? Do you know? They just naturally lived it out in fellowship with God. That was why they were created, to be in fellowship with their creator. And then sin entered the world. And after sin entered the world, the heart's desire became marred. The image of God had been tainted. We are all still created in the image of God, but sin has stained what was once pure. And as a result, humanity began searching for purpose in possessions and accomplishments and pleasure and education and knowledge. And we've left God out of it and we focused on things under the sun. And then ever since then, we're asking, why am I here? What is my purpose in life? And why has it become such a burden and seems so hard to figure out? Our purpose in life is only found when shifting our focus from earthly to eternal. This book, like I said, of Ecclesiastes, in a sense, it makes sense that it's depressing because the perspective and the lens is on under the sun. It's on an earthly view. But what feels weird if you are a believer and you have an eternal perspective, you're like, wait a minute, is life meaningless? It's not when you have an eternal perspective. It is when you have an earthly perspective. So that makes sense. There's little hope in anything in life 
when we only consider things under the sun or of the world. In a sense, we get focused on the wrong things to find our purpose. Right now, currently, I have lost a really important book of mine. I have the book of the Bible, uh, I, the whole Bible I have in these little tiny individual books. And one of mine is the book of Romans. And Jeff and I studied this book together. So it's just this thick. If you see it, please tell me. <laughs> but I can't find it. And it's important to me. And it's value to me, valuable to me. And I've searched my house up and down, inside out. I've looked through my office. I've opened my backpack a thousand times. I don't know where where it is, and I don't know where else to look for it. But if someone who knows where my book is or who knew where my book is were to come up to me and tell me, you should look here, the book is here, I would go look right away. I wouldn't hesitate. I wouldn't question. I would go look and find what was lost that's important to me that I find valuable. Sin has hidden our purpose and our meaning to life. It has disguised it so we can't see it or find it. And if we keep looking where it's not, we will never find it. I can tell you my book is not at my mom's house. And if I were to go to my mom's house and keep looking there, I'm never going to find it. I at least know it's not there. But God, in his mercy and grace and loving kindness, is the one who knows our purpose and knows the meaning. And he has revealed it to us. So the question is, are we eager and excited and willing to look where God reveals humanity's purpose? Will we look there? He didn't reveal it in money. He didn't reveal it in careers. He didn't reveal it in things or stuff or self-help books of the world. He revealed it in his word, in his book, in his truth. Now I googled, how do I find purpose in life? And up popped article after article, after article of wisdom under the sun on how to figure out the purpose of life. And they all pretty much said the same thing. Seven things to find your purpose in life. Twelve things to get meaning out of life. Fifteen things for your purpose in life. Ten ways to find your meaning and purpose in life. And when I read them all, they all overlapped. Okay? So I want to show you these, the wisdom under the sun... And I want us to shift how we take that wisdom, if you will, and we shift it from an earthly mindset to an eternal mindset. So I've given you this chart in your handout as well. What I have for you, what I'm going to talk to you about is some of the verses. I'm going to say them to you, but you have all the scripture references there. I've given you the scriptures to correlate, in a sense, with the wisdom under the sun. Where is the eternal perspective in this earthly wisdom. Remember, this earthly wisdom means, it doesn't mean that it's not valuable. What Solomon is saying and what he learned is that if we only consider this without an eternal perspective, in the end, it's going to be meaningless and a chasing after the wind because life isn't fair and we all have the same fate and we all go to the grave. So how do we make meaning out of our life? we get focused on the eternal. So one of the things is you need to develop a growth mindset, the world says. This means when you fail, get up and try again. When you fail, get up and try again. What does an eternal mindset say? We look at scripture where it says, we are struck down, but not destroyed. We are jars of clay. We have our bodies here. We are gonna fall down, but we get up. Why? Because the psalmist says that when we stumble, the Lord upholds us with his righteous hand. And Paul writes in Thessalonians, may God himself sanctify you through and through. This idea of having a growth mindset is the idea that you become better from your failures. The Bible says that God will sanctify us through and through. We are changed for the better 
because of the word of God. You want to have a growth mindset to understand why you're here a little bit better? Let God sanctify you. Have an eternal perspective. Have a personal vision statement, they say. Guess what our vision statement is as Christians? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This comes straight out of Deuteronomy. And guess what? God was the author of vision boards. How many of you have ever made a vision board? Okay, you know what he says in Deuteronomy after he tells you this? He literally says that we are supposed to talk about them at home and on the road, tie them as symbols on our hands and bind them on our foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and your gates. That is a lot more permanent than a poster board with magazine clippings. God wanted us as well to have this vision for him. Love him with all your heart, soul, and mind. And don't ever forget about it. Think about it day and night. Give back, the world says. Yes, God says God loves a cheerful giver. Paul says God loves a cheerful giver. And he tells us in Philippians, do nothing out of selfish ambition. That we are to share with God's people in need. We're to practice hospitality, feed, and offer drink to your enemy even. I don't know of many secular self-help books that are gonna tell you to love and feed and offer drink to your enemy to help you find purpose in life. That's a radical difference. Practice gratitude. Paul says give thanks in all circumstances, not just when life is going well. We are to be grateful for trials as well. As we see pain in the purpose, James says, consider it pure joy when you, con when you confront trials. Why? Because that develops perseverance and perseverance leads to a mature faith. So we don't just turn pain into purpose because it's a good idea. We do it to mature our faith. Explore your passions. If you were here this weekend with Dr. Greg Tonkinson, he spoke all about this. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it, go online to azcc.org and find uh, the message from there. These are your spiritual gifts. Jump in. Say yes. Each one of you has been given a gift. Get out and use it for the kingdom of God. Be a part of the community. The author of Hebrews tells us, don't give up meeting together. If you are online and you don't have the ability for, for physical reasons to come, call. Have a community through a Zoom community. Have a phone call connection with somebody or whatever. You can't have community alone behind a television or a computer. And for those of you who are here, stay here. I, God bless the community you have. I know the fellowship for you has blessed you greatly when you walk over to the community center. That's why we call it a community center. And you have your table with your people and you pray for each other. We're supposed to do that. Small groups or, or Sunday school churches or Bible studies. And then it says, consider your company. Who do you spend time with? The Bible encourages us to actually encourage each other. Wisdom under the sun encourages us to spend time with people that inspire us. The author of Hebrews tells us to inspire others as well. If we're all inspiring others, then someone's gonna be in our circle that inspires us. And we're supposed to spend time with those people. In fact, Psalm 1-1 warns us of who not to spend time with. Do not spend time with the wicked, the mockers, the continual or habitual sinners, the one who revel in their sin, enjoy their sin, and find nothing wrong with their sin. This is don't spend time. Don't sit, stand, or walk with any of those lest they ensnare you or entrap you. What a chasing after the wind that is. Read. If you want to know the purpose of life, read the author of life. 
Read about the one who actually created you and gave you the purpose. If you're thinking to yourself, I just want to know why I was here. Go to the one who made you. Why would you go to somebody who doesn't even know you, who's never even met you? Go to the one who knows you so well. He has counted every hair on your head. Go to him. Read him about him. Join a cause. Let me tell you something. You know what join a cause means? Find something to defend. Worth defending. Paul writes in Ephesians, you're to live a life worthy of your calling. What cause are you automatically a part of when you become a Christian? The cause for the gospel. You've already joined a cause if you have said yes to Jesus. And your cause is to defend the gospel. Now, if you want to join other causes, great. Do it with an eternal mindset. Do it for the glory and kingdom of God. You can join as many causes as you want. Just keep your focus eternal. But know this, if you thought to yourself, oh, I've never been a part of something. If you're a Christian, yes, you have. You're a part of the cause of the gospel. The best one, the most important one to be a part of. So let's live it out. Self-acceptance, the world says, you got to accept, accept yourself. Don't compare yourself, though, to the wisdom under the sun. God says you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that your identity is in Christ. And if you need to, repeat that to yourself every day. The world tells us, take time for self-care. Guess where that started? Genesis. On the seventh day, God rested. And then he told us to take a Sabbath and rest. God designed our bodies, minds, and souls to rest. Look, this is not a new or modern day concept, self-care. It just went from Sabbath to self-care. People just repackaging it. Do you notice how all of this wisdom under the sun, in a sense, has been borrowed from the Bible? We think we're so smart here, coming up with all of these ways to find meaning and purpose when God is the originator of it all. He gave it to us thousands of years ago, and it hasn't changed What's our purpose? Live out the scriptures and you live out your purpose. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Finally, the author of Ecclesiastes shifts from earthly to eternal. And we look at him saying, all this stuff under the sun, it has nothing meaning unless you're willing to not fear God and trembling, like I don't know who you are, but revere. I revere you, God. You are greater than all. You are almighty. You are majestic. You are the creator. I fear you. I love you. I revere you. And I'm going to look to you to find my meaning and my purpose and as I get in the scriptures and I obey them and I live them out, that heart, that part of my heart that desires validation for why I'm here is going to be satisfied and full and settled. We live with an eternal perspective. You don't have to find a new job. You don't have to get a new relationship or volunteer an X number of hours or give an X number of dollars or help an X number of people. There's no system, no checklist, no formula. If we live with wisdom under the sun, perhaps our meaningless life might be okay if you travel enough or enjoy, have money enough to enjoy certain things. But if we live with an eternal perspective, fearing God and living out the scriptures, we will live with meaning and with purpose. If someone asks you, why are you here? What's your purpose in life? Every Christian should answer, I'm here to live for God. I am here to revere God. I am here to live out God's word. Anything I do and everything I do is for him. And then they'll say, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I mean, why are you really here? 
Why did God put you here? And you answer, I'm living my purpose. It doesn't matter what I do. If I, if I think my purpose was here to be a mother, live in such a way that I live out the scriptures to be the best mother I can be. If I thought my purpose was here to be the CEO of a company, live and be the best CEO by living out the scriptures to be that best CEO that you can be. Because motherhood can change. Uh, your CEO position can change. But the one thing that is eternal is God. He doesn't change. So every time you and I live out the scriptures, we live in our purpose. That will never change. That stays the same. Life's purpose is so much simpler for the believer. It's live out the scriptures. In your hard time, if your life, remember I said, this doesn't promise it's gonna have this best, happy, easy life. The way to bring purpose and meaning in any stage of life is to live out the scriptures. Some of you are going through some very, very difficult things in life right now. You wanna have meaning and purpose in your most hardest, challenging, difficult time of life? Live out the scriptures. And there's your purpose. You and I are here to bring glory to God, to shine a light, to live out his truth. That's why we are put here. And when we do that, nothing, and I mean nothing on this earth can compete with the meaning and purpose of our life. You will have a fulfilled heart, living with an eternal perspective. All these other things Solomon says, maybe or maybe not, they'll give you temporary happiness. But that part of your heart that longs for meaning, it needs an eternal perspective. It was created for an eternal perspective. And just like we read in the opening, it was created for God. And once we push everything else out, we re leave room for him to come in and reside. Let's be resolute to live with an eternal perspective. And look at this book and say, yeah, it makes sense that this is depressing. Because until we shift and put our eyes on God, it's going to feel that way. So we can be resolute to shine that light for others as well. Let me close it.